Hi there everyone, my name is Ollie. I'm a final year medical student at the University of Warwick in the UK and my glasses are reflecting way too much. Let's do without. So today we're going to be talking about the idea of compulsory vaccination, specifically should vaccines be mandatory, be compulsory for children. I'm sure if you grow up in the UK, most of you will be familiar with the common vaccines that you might have as a child, things like measles, mumps, rubella, hepatitis, tuberculosis. And all of these things have ultimately the same goal. The purpose of a vaccine is that by exposing someone, in this case a child, to a particular virus or a bacterium in a controlled way, you will allow that person to trigger a small immune response and start to build their own antibodies in their blood in, and start to build their own antibodies within their body to make it so that if they come into contact with that pathogen in the real world, they will already have the antibodies that know how to deal with that problem and they won't get seriously ill as a result. You've got to give the body something to work with, so whether that's a small fragment of the bug as it would appear or an inactivated or attenuated weakened form of the bug so that it doesn't run rampant inside the body, you're just giving them a template from which to work. Now the process of vaccination actually appeared around the 10th century and today it basically represents the most effective way of preventing disease outbreaks. Many of you will be familiar with the surgeon Edward Jenner who noticed that dairy workers who had contracted cowpox when they were uh, going and milking the cows very rarely seemed to have smallpox and this was obviously when smallpox was running rampant killing everyone which we now know to be caused by the variola virus. So what Edward Jenner did is he found a milkmaid um, who had cowpox and this was evidenced by the fact that they had these pustules and blisters and um, it didn't really do much else cowpox but it gave them these blisters and he took some of the pus and inoculated an eight-year-old boy James Phipps with this pus who then did not go on to develop smallpox at all as most people of the time did. Now flashing forward back to today there is essentially no doubt, right, among doctors and among public health bodies that vaccines are a very effective tool that we have. But the question as to whether they should be compulsory is a little bit more complicated. And I should say that in an interview process, your examiner may challenge you on your personal beliefs here. So do be sure to give this issue some proper thought. But let's just weigh up some of the arguments here. So to start with, vaccines are by and large incredibly safe. By the time they get ready to be deployed, they are suitable for mass inoculation over millions and millions of people and side effects must be extremely rare. There may be some temporary discomfort such as pain, swelling, irritation at the site of inoculation, but these minor problems that someone would experience tend to massively outweigh say, getting polio. And secondly, they reduce burden on the health service, right? Because if you can inoculate people and prevent them getting meningitis, mumps, rubella further down the line, they don't have to be taken to hospital. They don't have to go to infectious disease units or be placed in intensive care. We basically expend far, far less resources on treating them than if we prevent them getting it in the first place. This is the golden dream of a public health intervention. And along those same sorts of lines, many of these conditions are extremely debilitating and can actually result in long-term disability, which obviously then has costs of its own beyond just the acute treatment. We don't have to resuscitate people, but they may develop these problems and require surgery or further monitoring down the line. All of that goes away if we can vaccinate them and stop them getting the disease in the first place. And if we're thinking about compulsory vaccination, as in everyone should be forced effectively to have it, or it should be made a legal requirement to have it, herd immunity is the other major thing we need to consider. And this revolves around the idea that infectious diseases in order to sustain and propagate the life forms that cause them, whether that's a virus or a bacterium or a fungus or a parasite of some sort, they have to move and spread between hosts, right? The goal of all life forms is effectively to reproduce and they need human vectors, human hosts, in order to do that. But by vaccinating people, we remove that potential vector pathway because they can't spread effectively via vaccinated people. And the reason why we need to not only be concerned with the symptoms that people display and how we're going to treat them, but also this idea of stopping it spreading, is that because within our society, within our population, we actually have a small percentage of people who are either immunosuppressed, very sick already, or may not be suitable candidates for a particular vaccine. You could just simply be allergic to it. 
And if you're allergic to it, that means you can never have that vaccine and never get that immunity. It would obviously be dangerous to administer the vaccine to one of these people who may suffer much more than if we didn't give them it at all. So the net benefits of that intervention would not outweigh the harms. But coming back to herd immunity, if we remove as many vectors for disease transmission and spread as possible, that is vaccinating as much of your population as you can, that actually protects these groups of people who are immunocompromised, unsuitable for the vaccine, because it means they're much less likely to be exposed to the disease at all, and therefore less likely to become ill or even die. Now, the amount of your population that you'd need to vaccinate for herd immunity does vary, and it's calculated in a value called the herd immunity threshold, HIT, but depending on the disease and the population and so on, it can be as high as 95%. And what we're trying to do ultimately is reach a situation where we have a very high percentage of people immune or vaccinated to it and no known cases in our population because when we get to there the disease is considered eradicated because no new cases can develop under those conditions. So with all of that said you might be wondering why would anyone object to compulsory vaccination? And be really really clear here because we're talking about the term compulsory, that is obligatory, it's something that you are forcing on your population. This means something that someone could in theory object to but they would face consequences if they didn't so they might be fined or thrown in prison or have some other sanction put against them. It's quite serious. So for example, depending on the age at which you're going to give your vaccine, it may be that the child in question, say they're an infant or a neonate, they would be too young to consent and they need their parents to consent on their behalf. That parent then operates with their own autonomy as to whether this intervention is going to be made on their child and they may well decide that they don't want the child to have it. And many people would argue that if a parent decides that for whatever reason they feel that it's unsuitable for that vaccine to be given, they should have the right to refuse it. And this is at its root a more libertarian type of argument because essentially what we're thinking about is giving the government power to force someone or a child against their parents' wishes to be inoculated with a substance that they might not want in their body. Essentially, does that give the government too much power in interfering with the general public? Many people would say that it does. And of course, one of the really major reasons why people might not want either themselves or a child to have a vaccine is that they're concerned about the health effects. I'm sure that most of you will be very familiar with the Andrew Wakefield case where he purported this link between the combined MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, rubella, and autism, which, which obviously now is a complete nonsense. There was a Lancet paper that was accepted when it shouldn't have been, and he's been struck off. He's no longer a practicing doctor in the UK. It all became a massive nonsense. But parents were very worried because of the media reporting on all of this that their kids might come to harm. And of course you wouldn't want to give a vaccine if you thought that your kids might be harmed. Now, whether or not you feel that autism constitutes harm or not is a very, very different topic. But in the general case, even if they come from a place of misinformation, people can have very good reasons, at least that appear good and consistent in their own mind, for not wanting these sorts of treatment. So when that happens, we need to think about other ways that we might want to promote vaccine uptake without forcing it on people. I think this is the happy middle ground, at least in my own opinion. In the United Kingdom, for example, we know that vaccination rates have historically actually been really high relative to our population size, although they have begun to fall in recent years. So scientists obviously started looking at this and saying, well, what's actually going on? And there are two key things that were identified. The first is that parents were less likely to want to vaccinate their children when they hadn't had a proper frank discussion with a doctor or a healthcare professional about the risks and benefits, usually just owing to time and appointment length and things like that. It's actually quite difficult to contact a doctor, even if you want to. And then the second thing is that this was exacerbated by people not being able to make appointments to get the vaccine around a busy working schedule because most people now are working during the day and they can't necessarily take time off easily. And what we have to realize is that even though these things would contribute to a lowered vaccine rate, these are actually systemic failings by the health care system and not anything to do with the patients or the parents themselves. And lastly, I would proffer that forced vaccination 
is likely only to reinforce any sense of distrust or miscommunication between doctors and parents. We really rely on good communication as healthcare workers, as medical students, as future doctors to ensure that patients have the best outcomes possible. And although mistrust and confusion about whether or not they should bring their child to be vaccinated won't necessarily cause any acute problem because these diseases, tetanus, measles, mumps, all of these things are very rare, mostly thanks to vaccination, but if there is a sense of distrust then they might be unwilling to bring their children when something more serious happens. If they suddenly develop a meningitis or something you really need to know about that. So by fostering good communication habits early on you're actually potentially saving that child from potential danger further down the line. So that's where we're going to wrap this video guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel and don't forget to go and check out ollieburton.com for all of my free interview resources and videos. If you've got more questions, be sure to let me know down in the comments below.